Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Watstein and have the privilege of serving as UNCW's University Librarian. It's also my privilege to be the first on tonight's Thirsty Tome program. Welcome to Randall Library, to the first of our cultural activities for the 2015-16 academic year, and to you, our community of friends, students, peers, and scholars. Christopher Rhodes, who's going to be speaking after me, has asked me to speak a little bit about the space that you're in. And for those of you that are returning students, or returning faculty, returning administrators, there's been quite a dramatic change here since May, June of this past spring semester. Please take a moment to turn around so you can best appreciate my second welcome, which is welcome to our newly renovated first floor spaces. I'm gonna talk a little bit, if you can indulge me for a few minutes, about the dramatic changes in the spaces behind you, um, in this space here, and even in the bound periodical stacks. So what's new? Nothing short of radical transformation. And again, this has all happened since May and June 2015. First of all, I'm excited to announce that after five weeks of shifting, the entire bound periodical collection, which is our print periodicals, approximately 188,000 bound journals, taking up approximately 9,404 individual shelves were moved by hand, and the empty library shelving came down, making room for about 5,200 square feet of new student space. It's hard to visualize if you weren't here before, but all of that space, that back quadrant that's behind this side of the room, was all stacks. So all that stack is gone, um, we've replaced duplicate periodicals with electronic formats, condensed our shelving, and it's a, it's a significant change to the first floor. Christopher, how many seats have we added? I'm going to put him on the stop. Approximately 130. Okay, so approximately 130 seats added in that space behind this half of the room. This year also, at the end of the academic year, we were extremely fortunate to receive monies from the Division of Academic Affairs, which we are part of, and we continued our investment in furnishings, and all the furnishings that you see out in that area are brand new. You can see that we were very creative. Um, we're trying different types of furniture, and during the course of the year, uh, Christopher, who's our facilities coordinator, coordinator and cultural activities liaison, will be working with colleagues to assess how students are using and enjoying the space. The new space represents further expansion of available study space for students and overall our commitment to student study and collaboration needs. Carpeting. A um, couple more comments about the new spaces. And actually, we're, are they done? They might almost be done with all this. Yeah, two more days. Okay, what we've done is continue our uh, commitment to replace tired old floor covering um, with quality flooring that will better support the dramatically increased traffic in Randall Library. And you see that new floor covering there, and in fact they're now working on completing that project in the remaining bound periodicals area. Two more items. We shifted our featured new books and audio books to this area here. We are waiting for the backs of those shelving units. It's not intentionally strange, um, but we have enhanced that area and will continue to develop the featured new books and audio books, which are high circulating items in our collection. And lastly, about our physical space, you'll see banners um, in our new space and also in the atrium as you come in, and those banners reflect the core values of the library. I want to thank the Randall Library staff who contributed to shifting the bound periodical collection, the selection of furniture, the development of digital and visual media to keep our users informed of projects underway, and most especially, I want to recognize um, one of our associate directors who lives to tell the tale of this shift, and Susanna Benedetti, who is our associate director for technical and collection management services. So I'm proud to welcome you to this new space, and now I'm going to turn it over to Christopher Rhodes. Thank you. Good evening, and 
welcome to Randall Library's Thirsty Tome, an annual event celebrating the culture of creative writing at UNCW and in our community. Thirsty Tome has been happening for well over 10 years. Uh, my name is Christopher Rhodes, and I am the Facility Coordinator and Cultural Activities Liaison here at Randall Library. I also serve as Chair for the Library's Programming and Exhibits Team, or the PET, as we are affectionately call ourselves. Thirsty Tome is a great example of how our team can deliver events that reflect the university's mission, in this case, with a true collaboration with the UNCW Department of Creative Writing. Not only is our featured guest, Gwendolyn Knapp, an MF, sorry, a graduate of their MFA program, but two of their distinguished faculty members, Clyde Edgerton and Robert Anthony Siegel, have graciously accepted my invitation to be part of tonight's program. I'd also like to express gratitude to Lisa Bertini for her help spreading the word about Thirsty Tome and for organizing tonight's MFA readings. We are honored to have Mrs. Sartorelli here for us, with us tonight, especially as Chancellor Sartorelli has often highlighted our creative writing program's high quality and national prominence. Thank you for coming. I'm very excited to get tonight's event underway, but I wanted to mention an event coming up at Randall Library this fall. The renowned work of Ms. Susan Mara, a master quilter, will be exhibited in the Cab Art Gallery beginning this Thursday, August 27th. The exhibit of Ms. Mara's quilts will honor her selection as a North Carolina living treasure by the UNC Wilmington Museum of World Cultures. Please join us in the gallery this Thursday for an opening reception beginning at 5.30 p.m. You may have noticed a particularly vibrant backdrop for our event tonight. Dubtown Skates, Skateboarding Culture and Applied Learning at UNCW, which features skateboard decks designed by UNCW Art 101 students under the, under the direction of Assistant Professor Ann Lindberg. And Ann's not here, but she's pretty awesome. Um, we may have, we, Sorry. We have many more events and exhibits planned for fall, including ones tied in with the UNCW Synergy Common Reading, uh, Band Books Week, Veterans Day, and more. Please visit uh, uncw.edu slash events for more information. Uh, so now let's get started with a few readings from current MFA students. Bethany? Hi, I'm Bethany Tapp. I'm a third year fiction student in the MFA program. And I'm going to be reading from a new project that I'm working on. It's the beginning, so. Madam doesn't know about my plan. She knows a lot of things, like how to milk snakes for venom and how to concoct enticing chemical mixtures, drugs that'll leave you licking your lips, leaving, leave you aching for more. She knows how to conduct a raid, always comes out with the best things, prescription pills, condoms, tampons, over-the-counter meds. But she doesn't know that when it's my turn to clean the caller's half dozen rooms, I sometimes find their pocket change in the sheets and keep it, even though we're supposed to give everything we find to Mr. Madam's husband. Mercy says it's foolish, but I don't keep all of it, only the pennies and nickels. I've saved up $5.87 in just over a month since Vivi gave me the idea. It doesn't seem like much, but if Vivi were here, she'd say that's progress. It'll cost more than that to hitch a ride to the next town, Elle says, and she's right. Most travelers that come round would want a lot more than old currency for the extra burden on the horses to take me up the Cape Fear River to Elizabethtown. But I'm not aiming to hitch a ride, and the next town's not far enough. The gold city in the north. Mercy says it's just a rumor. When the world ended, it ended, she says. Civilization. And she makes a gesture like an explosion, gone. Mercy's old enough to remember a world before this one, old enough to have lost everyone she loved to the virus, old enough to have lost faith. But Vivi believed in the gold city, so I do too. Take me with you, Charlie, Natty says, and I tell her I will because I love her and she loves me. I know this, even if some days I don't. Even if the man with the toupee is kissing her neck and mouth and she's letting him, even though Madam has strict rules about kissing. Mr. doesn't care, but Madam knows these things matter, but she doesn't know about the change, and Mercy says that's good and I should keep it that way. Elle nods, but Natty keeps her eyes down. No one knows it's both of us that's aiming to leave. That's our secret. 
Today I've got the man with the red cheeks. They're redder than Madam's after she's rouged, and I wonder if the man with the red cheeks knows he's awful feminine. He also has long eyelashes and a slight curve to his nose like a swan's beak and a neck to match it. Regal, Natty says. Sometimes, Elle adds, touching her belly that's swollen with what we all know belongs to the man with the red cheeks. But I don't think he knows that. And Mr. and Madam don't know either. Mercy told Elle to get rid of it, and doesn't she remember the last time? And isn't it worse to get it out and see it? Tiny fingers and toes, pink wrinkly skin and that smell. Something older than memory, a time before language, and brand new all at once. And then to have to say goodbye, hardly getting to hold on to it before Madam says to give it here. And Mr. shakes his head and shakes his head. And you'll find him a good home, won't you, Mr.? Of course, he says, and Natty reminds Elle of that, reminded Elle of that last night. But Mercy only shook her head. Later, Elle cried a little in her sleep. I heard her since she sleeps in the bunk above me. Natty sneaked in that night, and when I kissed her mouth, I could almost taste the man with the toupee's breath, tobacco-y wet leather taste. I told her I was too tired for that now, and won't you just hold me tonight, Natty? In the morning, when I check the schedule, I see it's me who has the man with the red cheeks and not Elle, which is strange because he always asks after her, pays more for her, whispers to Mr. that he loves her, which Madam doesn't like. He's getting grand ideas, I hear her tell Mr. on the stairway that leads to their quarters. They didn't see me standing in the dim candlelight, not hiding, but just listening. They didn't see me, even when I followed them on tiptoe, pressed my ear against their door. He wants to marry her, Mr. told Madam, who laughed. Her laugh was loud and made me remember the smell of blood, the sticky feel of it, the dark black of it, all the while the laughter ringing and ringing, and I had to go back down the stairs on account of I was going to be sick. He isn't so bad, Elle tells me as she tightens my bra straps for me, tugs at the tie in the back of the lightest sh sunshine chemise. As bad as the man with the bow tie, I ask? <laughs> no one's as bad as him, Mercy laughs. Natty says nothing, and I know she's thinking of the man with the toupee. What about mister, I ask, and Mercy says she ought to slap me for being disrespectful and stupid. I talk too much, I think, later as I'm waiting in room three for the man with the red cheeks. He's late, and I pull the curtains wide open to let the sun in the sunlight, examining myself in the full-length mirror. I never look the way I think I should. My eyes are too big, my cheeks too pronounced. My chin still has the dimple that I recognize. My hair is still brown, but it's thinner now, and the cowlick that my grandmother used to complain about is gone. I wonder if she is still alive. How many years has it been? I used to count the days waiting for my father to find me. I think it has been over three years now. I think I turned 17 without remembering it was my birthday. Thank you, Chris Rhodes, and everyone who puts together um, this event, um, Thirsty Tome, and any events like Thirsty Tome. I think it's very important. Um, I'm glad to be here. My name is Elizabeth. I'm a poet, uh, third year, and we'll just dive right in. Unfortunately, some of my poems will need a little context. Um, there are character-driven poems and kind of like novel and verse that I'm working on. Uh, so for this poem, you'll need to know Ashley, who is a mother of three children who have been taking into foster care. Um, there's a reference to DSS, of course that's the Department of Social Services, and her middle son's name is Cody. The title of the poem is, Ashley Receives Cody's Outgrown Clothes from DSS. A cardboard box sits on the porch step, its sides softened from wet August heat. When she plies the lid open, she sees his favorite sweatshirt, NASCAR colors and chewed up sleeve cuffs. It still smells a bit like him, like cut grass and wet candy, but some pricey detergent nearly chokes it out like a god-awful floral cloud clogging her boy's scent. She rolls the cuffs between her thumbs and fingers, and they're still damp from his spit. She pictures his wrists, longer now, dangling out. Her mama always says, it seems only seconds between when they start teething and when they start mouthing. She's sure they had to tear, she's sure they had to tear it away from him but her middle child is the quiet, worried one who bowls and frets in silence for the small, forgotten bits like a missed morning hug or a half-packed lunchbox left on the counter. She burrows her face into the pill ball cotton, imagines her son pushing out knees, elbows, and new words, maybe some of them sharp and angular like his mama, 
As for her, she's been wearing the same jeans from 18 on, and it makes her work buddies jealous to stay the same size like that after three kids and all this time. But as she slumps into the cloth, she gives like a waistband that wears itself out through years of gaining and losing, like an elastic band spent from simply having to hold itself up. All right, um, and then the next one we have Cody, which you just heard from him, and David, who is the foster father. The title of this poem is, After Church, David Watches the NFL. It's always a Sunday when Dad is most likely to slip through Cody's lips. Sometimes David slips too, distracted by a good tackle, and lets him. Still, his body betrays him. Even as he sits couched and whistle sounds and the screen's green glow, Cody can see he doesn't have his Coca-Cola eyes or a gritty blonde mop. His thumb joints and jawline aren't sharp like his. The same truth occurs to David when Cody climbs his shoulders, swings around to sit on his paunch and points to the tip of his own widow's peak. From there, he traces a see-through string to the mirrored spot on David's forehead. A few seconds pass this way. The grown man is pinned under the lightness of that fingertip and the patient sitting in a small face. For a moment, he believes Cody will hold him there until his hairline takes the hint and begins to grow towards their meeting place. Thank you so much. And the last one, I'm not exactly sure whose voice this is from, but it seems to me to be someone who's been through foster care, but maybe is an adult now looking back. It's very retrospective. The title is On Foster Care. It's all all right so long as you play a game in your head. Call it all a museum life, and this house becomes a snapshot from a family from long ago. Walk down the hallway. Look at the collection of small framed faces uh, in their own section to the side of strangers who bore the family that keeps you, grandparents and aunts and pets and houses and weddings that never bounced you on their knees. See your face last in the line of mismatched eyes and smiles, the kids under your forever family's care three years ago, a year ago, six months ago, now. Remember, it's just a bunch of artifacts old ways to live well in a different time. They're not what people at church might mutter as you walk through, not a bunch of do-gooders garbage, not 28 ways to beg for a pat on the back, not conversation pieces or trophies. Let it be what it is, a display. That way the sink's toothpaste stains turn sacred. The gravel path becomes hallowed ground and all the chip mugs turn to retired communion cups. Pretty soon everything squared, is squared up nice in your mind in uncracked glass. Everything becomes neat and quiet, and you become the only breathing, moving, passing through thing. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Ramos. I'm a third year creative nonfiction student here, and uh, I will be reading a piece, a uh, flash nonfiction piece called Thank You for Your Service. We represent the VA, the man in the buy two, get one free suit says. I never serve, but I want to say thank you for your service, he says. For your sacrifice, he says. I watch him. I only hear the never serve part, an outsider. The woman, blonde West Virginian, speaks next. I just want to say that I never served either, but it's my duty and honor to take care of you, she says. We, at the VA, we are honored to serve you. We understand what you've been through, and we want to help. We'll answer all of your questions and tell you what benefits as a veteran you are, are available to you. Another outsider. To file your claim yet, one fat Navy chief whispers to another as the VA rep ends his brief, gives us a five-minute break. No, the other says. Well, you need to get that 100%, the fat one says and laughs. Got my hearing test done. Told the doc I can't hear shit in my knees and my back. Damn, boats, the other says. Give me my 100% and my retirement pay and I'll be set. 20 years on the boat, I've earned it, the fat one says. The other chief laughs. The fat one laughs. I hear you, the other one says. I say nothing. We're in civilian clothes. No ranks today, just names. And what about the poor bastard that only did four years and got blown the fuck up or shot up or watched his buddy die? Does he deserve it less? Does he have to wait behind you for the treatment at, cl at the clinic when we get out, even if he asks for help, which he won't? 
I bet you'll love it when people say, thank you for your service, won't you? It was an honor, you'll say. It was so hard, you'll say. When the fuck ever was it hard for you? He's right, another chief says. You're an ass, this chief says to the fat one. I didn't think I said that out loud. I got the PTSD, he says, confides in me. We're pals, he thinks. Young, old, crusty vets, brothers in arms. I say nothing. I look at the young man, white male, early in his 20s, local and balding, out of the army on a behavior discharge because big army didn't want to deal with him. It's a common story. They say I got the PTSD, he says again, and VA money's coming to me and I need it bad. Still, I say nothing. Where'd you deploy, I say. I didn't, he says. I never left. I never left Fort Campbell, he says, but my friend committed suicide. You saw him, I say. Well, no, but I was there when he did it, he says. Oh, in the room, I say. No, I was on liberty, and he stayed on base, and when I came back, they told me, he says. But it hit me real hard, you know, because he was my friend, and then with all the drill sergeants talking about Iraq and the stress of getting ready to deploy, I guess I got the PTSD, he says. And my command, they put me out with an OTH because they said I was a medical commando, always wanting to go to the doctor because of my back is messed up from the Army. But I wasn't, you know. The Army, they just didn't like me. My command, they had it out for me. Well, how'd you hurt your back, I say. How long were you in, I say, before he can answer for his back? I don't know how I hurt my back. It just always hurt, he says. And I was only in nine months. I stare at him and say nothing. Not that nothing can be said. Too much, in fact. Things that aren't kind, that aren't helpful. I don't tell him we aren't equals. That his story doesn't count. How many people thank him for his service, I wonder. My wife, Lisa, doesn't sleep much takes or has taken Lunesta, Ambien, or some other chemical with bad side effects but should let you sleep, and it affects her bad, but doesn't let her sleep. She tosses, turns, gets up, lies down. In my sleep, I hear her. She whimpers when she does sleep, shakes, fights, dives for cover. No, I didn't, or none of that happened. Or so do you sometimes, she says in the morning, or in the afternoon, or any time I bring it up. It did, I say. No, it didn't, she says. And sometimes she says sorry for waking me. One day at breakfast, she tells me that that man over there is her old sergeant major. This one time before Holly got killed, she says, we were on our way to breakfast at the chow hall on Blue Diamond when a rocket came in and he dove on me and threw us in a ditch. The rocket exploded where I'd been walking, she says. She shrugs. When Holly died, he took it real hard, she says. She worked directly for him, he says. Lisa touches the black bracelet on her wrist etched with Holly's name and date. And I already know that she helped pack Holly's things to send them home. After years of convincing, she applies for VA disability, combat-related PTSD. She was in imminent danger. Someone she cared about died. She was in country for a year. Requirements met. It's just depression, the VA says. No, we didn't look at the evidence, the VA says. No one thanks my wife for her service. When we go places to Veterans Day things, to Memorial Day things, the older vets and civs, they come up, shake my hand, tell Lisa how proud of me she must be. They thank her for supporting her veteran. We laugh, Lisa and I. She's a vet too, I say. Did a year in Ramadi when it was the Wild West and dudes were dying fast and messy, I say. Oh, they say, confused, they walk away and they forget to thank her for her service. Walking our dog, we see him. White male, mid-twenties, just overweight, full beard, a contractor ball cap and paracord bracelet. A limp. Did you serve, I say? Yeah, he says. Is that where you got the limp, we say. Yeah, on and off, he says. You got in the VA to have it looked at, Lisa says. No, I want to go Special Forces, and I figure it'll ruin my chances if I have a bad knee, he says. So, you know, I'm trying to keep it out of my file, he says. I nod. So, you were Army, I say. Navy, he says. Oh, us too, we say. What was your rate? I was PSD, he says. Okay, but what did you do in the Navy, I say. Well, I guarded high-profile individuals on convoys in Iraq, he says. It was classified, he says. Well, I was in Iraq with 1st Marine Division. I know what PSD is. But what was your rate? Navy jobs are called rate. You should know that. Well, I was a medic, he says. The Navy doesn't have medics, we say. They have Navy corpsmen, and no Navy corpsman would call himself a medic unless speaking to outsiders. I look at Lisa. She looks at me. She shakes her head no. Well, good luck with everything, we say. We walk on. Fuck that guy, we say. A week later, that same man with the beard and the hat and the limp and the paracord bracelet is in line to claim his free Veterans Day Veterans Appreciation Meal at Golden Corral. I want to throw him out of line, ask him for his ID, DD-214, beat the shit out of him. But he doesn't have to provide any of those things. And people thank him for his service. Thank you.
Wow, thank you all. That was really awesome. Um, my name is Lisa Coates, and I am the first year engagement librarian here at Randall Library. I'm also the liaison librarian for the creative writing department, and hence one of the reasons I'm here um, to introduce Clyde Edgerton, who's going to do another introduction. Um, so, as you can see, we're into the introductions on this. Um, uh, Clyde, Clyde Edgerton was uh, raised in the community of Bethesda near Durham, North Carolina. He has published 10 novels, a book of advice, Papa Daddy's book for new fathers, it's hilarious, and a memoir, Solo, My Adventures in the Air. The Night Train, his 10th novel, was published by Little Brown in uh, 2011, and it received multiple starred reviews. Three of his novels have been made into movies, and stage adaptations have been made from seven of his books. Rainy was recently per, uh, performed at Theater Now. Anybody see that? It was really good. Um, yeah, it was really good. Uh, and there were special evenings when Edgerton did intro introduce the play uh, with storytelling, banjo playing, singing. He's multi-talented. We like to call him the Renaissance Man. I don't know if anybody else does that. Um, I had the privilege to attend one of those events, and it was really highly entertaining and fun. Um, Edgerton's short stories and essays have been published in the New York Times Magazine, Best American Short Stories, Southern Review, Oxford American, Garden and Gun, and other publications. Among his awards are the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Lindhurst Prize, the Honorary Doctorates, and he has honorary doctorates from UNC Asheville and St. Andrews uh, Presbyterian College. He has a membership in the Fellowship of Southern Writers, the North Carolina Award for Literature, and five notable book awards from the New York Times. Uh, Edgerton is the Thomas S. Keenan III Professor of Creative Writing here at UNCW. I find him very approachable, and he's even been gracious enough to um, personally autograph several of his books on very short notice when I needed to give gifts and really <laughs> wanted to give gifts of his books. So please help me welcome Clyde Edgerton. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Lisa's great when you need to know how to work some of the stuff over here that you might not know how to work. She <laughs> helps me out a good bit. Gwendolyn now holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of North Carolina, as you've been told. Her fiction has appeared in Crazy Horse and Quarterly West, and her nonfiction has appeared in the Southeast Review, Hayden's Ferry Review, The Best Creative Nonfiction, Volume 2, and Narrative Lee. She also had a notable essay in the Best American Essays, 2013. Nat lives in New Orleans, where she is the editor of Eater New Orleans. Uh, my wife, Christina, wanted to write this introduction. She loved this book so much. And I said, no, I'm giving the introduction. <laughs> and we went back and forth, and finally I agreed to say some words from her introduction. Here they are. Tragic, delightfully funny, pours out her soul, the voice and heroine of our childhood, cry, laugh, truthfulness. So that's all I would do because I want to get through this so we get to Quindlin. <laughs> but I must read four metaphors. I've checked with Gwendolyn to be sure she's not going to read these four metaphors. I marked the book up. It's, it's an amazing book in my view but uh, the metaphors are these very short metaphors um, mom disappeared to the bathroom and wrapped her bites these are dog bites in rolls of gauze that had been in the drawer so long they aged like the teeth of coffee drinkers <laughs> the next one is about Aunt Mickey she carried enough cleaning products in the back of her car to kill off any potential passengers under the age of four. <laughs> I have two more. This one uh, I, I love, and it, it just brings to mind that uh, how important the visual is. Conrad said that the most important thing is to see uh, in, in writing. It's okay to understand, it's okay to empathize, it's okay to et cetera, et cetera, but to see. She came back with a very old guitar, brown and dusty. The strings rusted and hanging loose from the body like power lines down by heavy winds. I just love that one. And here's one more, the last one, one of 
five. Um, women from Southern, Southern media outlets, the group, wore hats so large they looked like cat beds with feather toys poking out the top. <laughs> and finally, judging from the quality of writing in this book, I have no doubt that if Gwendolyn had been the daughter of an oil baron and grew up in a four million dollar clean home, her book about that experience would have been as funny and sad and on target as this one is. That's because she is both a writer's writer and a reader's writer. Please welcome Gwendolyn Knapp. to read tonight from a chapter that actually appeared in the Southeast Review uh, way before this became a book. This, is kind of... um, this chapter is called The Motherload. Um, and essentially, I guess what you need to know, um, though it does really kind of stand alone, um, at, at this particular point in the book, um, my mother who is a hoarder, and her um, kind of manic depressive boyfriend, both whom are unemployed, are thinking about moving to New Orleans. And um, they're actually architects. One is a licensed architect. Um, and he, John, is looking for architecture jobs in New Orleans. So, the mother load. Is this okay? Mom and John drive 12 hours from Newport Ritchie to New Orleans in their Ford Focus, a hand-me-down from John's elderly mother who can no longer drive. The little car has decent gas mileage, a dozen throw pillows, and air conditioning that craps out around Tallahassee, so they arrive with steam pouring off their backs fajita style. <laughs> they fog up the French doors, greeting me with a foreboding welcome preferred by most house guests sent from another dimension. We're here. <laughs> it's nobody's vacation or birthday. It's the dead of summer July. People don't visit New Orleans in July unless they have to. But given the recession and lack of jobs back in Florida, the only option John, unemployed for the last seven months, has to find architecture work is to interview at firms 900 miles from home. Usually they stay at my sister's house in the Ninth Ward. But Molly's pregnant. A good excuse for her husband, Chris, to, guest, to get the guest room for a nursery the moment the in-laws cross the Orleans Parish line. Mom and John couldn't afford to fly. My mother herself doesn't like to fly or travel, really. We never took family vacations, just nice long guilt trips. <laughs> now they can't spring for a hotel either. There wouldn't be enough room for them anyways. My mother brings 14 pieces of luggage for a four-day trip. My stairs aren't what you'd call up to code. They wind sharply and steeply as if searching for the other half of their DNA strand. Then the cat likes to imitate a frozen turkey near the bottom and hopes you'll trip over her and smash her head through a French door so she can jump out and escape. After a quick restroom break, up the stairs and over the cat comes poor John with totes of canned soup and cake mix and lunch boxes of yogurts and tangerines. There are paper bags full of mixed nuts and fruit snacks, enough cliff bars to sculpt a Dr. Huxtable, and coolers of Cokes and water bottles. Mom and John never step foot outside without a fresh water bottle and a full pack of chiclets. Life for them has always been about hydration and fresh breath, even if they haven't gone to the dentist in 30 years. You know your mother. John shrugs and is off to haul up his suitcases, pillows, blankets, and shaving bag. These days, he's a big guy with a plethora of life is good shirts, a full head of silver hair, and bright blue eyes. Though right now, he's bright red and breathing like a marathon runner, handing me a lumpy plastic bag full of key limes. When you go down next, get the TP, Mom commands him. Mom is the authority on life is good apparel. She tells him what shirts to buy and when to wear them. Can I just rest a second, Margie? He asks. God damn it, John, go! God damn it, Margie, let me rest a second! 
<laughs> you haven't eaten since Panera Bread, Mom says. <laughs> You're starting to get cranky. <laughs> they always stop at the Panera Bread outside of Mobile. It's their special place. <laughs> but that means John hasn't ingested anything besides a few snack-sized Snickers in the past two hours. Are you believing that? She whispers to me as he retreats to the living room with his iPhone. He's such a baby. Then she picks up the back of her scalp. One day she'll eventually reach her brain. Until then, she, it looks like she's imitating a gorilla in deep thought. That looks painful, I tell her. It is painful, she says. Her scalp burns, bleeds, cracks, and crumbles. Her shoulder has a repetitive stress injury from holding her arm up to pick, which is why she now alternates hands, ambidextrously picking. A bald spot resides at the crown of her head that she camouflages by pinning back her thin bangs. Mom, I plead, stop with a scalp for the love of God. Yes, master, she says. <laughs> she takes a swig of soda and returns her hand to her scalp. She doesn't even know she's picking. It's just part of who she is now. I brought this Estee Lauder makeup case for you to have, honey, she says. This is her favorite thing, her doling out of possessions, her agenda of giving. Oh, I say. You don't want it? She asks. I guess I can give it to Molly. No, I say. Give it to me. It's these little acts of hoarding I've never been able to deny my mother. I take the makeup case in my arms like it's a new member of the family. There's no makeup inside. It's just a big empty caboodle for grown-ups. <laughs> so big I can keep my caboodle from childhood inside, but I don't. <laughs> I put my childhood caboodle on top of my adult caboodle in the corner of my bathroom. So now there's a caboodle stack with a basket of towels on top. <laughs> Normal people wouldn't be able to clown car a Ford Focus like mom, but she simply adds junk to the car like sprinkles to a cupcake, and she always has sprinkles for cupcakes, little candy bunnies and pumpkins that have been on the shelf so long they could cut glass. She spends the first afternoon baking Funfetti while John does everything he can to put his back out before his job interviews, hauling up extensive ephemera from the days of puffy paint and pogs, dozens of cassette tapes in a Looney Tunes shoebox, which used to house some pretty sweet Tweety Bird kids. In another box, I find some horrible craft projects Mom saved to remind us that cotton balls and Q-tips should be kept away from children, except in the case of bloody knees and earwax removal. <laughs> I brought him to a teddy bear picnic and I forgot him at the lady's house. It was an accident, honey. When I asked her about it, she said she hadn't seen him. That thieving hag, I say. She stole her yogi bear. I know, Mom says, rubbing my back as if we've just found out I have angina. Just breathe, honey. It'll be okay. <laughs> to make up for the fact that my Ewok is now a widow, <laughs> Mom wants me to have a piece of artwork consisting of 72 stuffed canvas sacks sewn onto a five-foot-tall, three-foot-wide canvas. There are two things my mother hates talking about, what she really did at Woodstock, and why the hell she ever constructed this hideous canvas structure, but they both may have to do with the lingering effects of LSD on the human psyche. <laughs> this piece of art is a piece of work. It's sort of a cross between a shoe rack and a sad display of saggy white tits. Things up along on Sex in the City, not in my apartment. But I take it in. I actually like it, I do. One day my dream of having a room full of mom's post-hippie weirdo art will be complete. Until then, I'm left to examine her personal eccentricities like this. She travels with a giant box her laptop came in. Really, I say, don't you have a laptop case? Well, I don't trust them. She says, as if speaking of her siblings are Republicans, from what I can tell, they don't really work. <laughs> from what I can tell, Mom herself has no plans to ever work again. Then there's John, who got laid off this year, so both of them have been locked in the house of hoarder, without solid plans for the future besides watching antiques, Antique Roadshow and throwing around the term early social security. We pick John up from his interviews, and take him to eat at one of the best restaurants in New Orleans, Coquette, for lunch. We're halfway through our meal, he realizes he's in a restaurant eating lunch. What is this place? He asks Mom, looking out from his phone. What is that? It's cargo, we say, doubting our appetizer. We can't afford this, John says. 
Stop talking about money, Mom says it's rude. She prefers the elephant in the room to please stay quiet and discreet as it flares its ears and charges our table, only to find our credit cards have all been declined. The prefix menu isn't that bad, I say. It's more expensive than Chili's. It's no more expensive than Chili's, but I suspect they'd be more comfortable with a hot tub of spinach dip and frozen drinks the color of blended gremlins. <laughs> followed by a visit to Barnes & Noble, the intellectual hemorrhoid that often troubles a Chili's backside. <laughs> Just have a beer and relax, Mom tells John. But John doesn't know any of the beers on the list, and it's obvious he can't relax with the anxiety caused by his interviews. This little Asian lady asked me if I ever worked overseas, like in the Middle East, he says, worried. John's never even been to the Mid-Atlantic. <laughs> After lunch, we head downtown in the Ford Focus. Most of the throw pillows mom stashed in the car are Mary Inglebright, a brand of quilty knickknackery that must be laced with some pheromone postmenopausal southern ladies can't resist. <laughs> Easy does it, a pillow's embroidery cautions before I toss it to the floor. <laughs> John, who has courteously pulled up the history of New Orleans on Wikipedia for iPhone, refuses to stop reading it. He's on a roll, mom says. She keeps and picking. I can now just snap my fingers and she stops with a scalp for a moment or two. The next step in her treatment will be electric shock therapy, Sinead O'Connor shave down, or total lobotomy. Your mother refuses to see a doctor, John says. I keep telling her she needs to see a doctor for that. I told her I'd pay for it. Oh, sure, Mom says, so you can hold that over my head? There's really no room for anything else to be held over her head with a hand already taking up the area. Oh, look, there's a police for rent, Mom says. Pull over. I keep going, but ignoring her is not a good tactic. I've been ignoring the fact that they're hell-bent on moving to New Orleans, and look how that's going. Probably the worst place a pack rat can move to is New Orleans, land of bargain centers and backyards turned to king statuaries. The ubiquitous be nice or leave signs on every door might as well read, enablers only. <laughs> Anyways, Mom can't afford a place big enough to house all her possessions. You need to be realistic about your situation, I say. You should probably look for a job first if you really want to move here. Well, I can't, she says. Why not? Because I'm going to take care of Molly's baby when she goes back to work. What? Yeah, I told her I don't want my grandbaby being raised in some weird daycare by a bunch of strangers. When did you decide this? We talked about it a few days ago. And Molly thinks it's a good idea. Of course she does, don't you? Um, I guess. Were you just not going to tell me? Well, I just did. <laughs> don't go to the National World War II Museum if you're already on the verge of crying. <laughs> it's a great museum, a must-see for history buffs, but it's hard to make it out of there with dry eyes. Tanks, planes, and Higgins boats line the bottom floor. Endearing veterans greet you at the door, so it's nearly impossible for someone like Mom to get in the ticket line after an entire hour of conversation and moseying around the C-47 in the entranceway. For most scholars, examination takes place in a library or study. For my mother, it has always been in a dressing room or produce section, considering every hair on a cashmere sweater or kiwi. This is what it's like to go to a museum with her, searching every historic photograph to see if she can spot a relative. <laughs> that, and she mutates into a, an historian the second the museum pen is clamped to her bosom. By the time we hit hour two, we haven't made it past the home front and I'm regretting not purchasing an audio tour headset. Well, this is part of the reason we became pack rats, Mom jokes, pointing to an exhibit of ration books, coins, and A&B bumper stickers for gasoline provisions. There are posters of women going without pantyhose or cuffs for their dresses. Mommy and Daddy saved every little thing. They trained us to hold on to every little thing. Weren't they supposed to donate stuff to the war effort, too, I ask, pointing to a stack of tires that goes to the ceiling, which represents how much rubber was donated during wartime. She chuckles, and I wonder if for all the times we've ever been to Goodwill, I've actually ever seen her donate anything. Back when I was stationed in Guam, John starts every sentence. Stop being annoying, Mom tells him. <laughs> Wounded, he disappears for most of the war. <laughs> Around the time we hit Normandy and Mom starts lecturing on a great uncle who was in the 101st Airborne Division, I finally tell her I could do without her commentary. 
Fine, she says. I won't say another word. How about I also stay 20 feet behind you? Would you like that too? <laughs> Stop it. You're really hard on me. You act like you don't even want me here. I don't deserve to be treated like this. Here we go. <laughs> Into the line for a Tom Hanks 4D movie, between all oh, beyond all boundaries. John stares vacantly into the restaurant. Mom pouts and I chew the last tasteless bit of chiclet. All of us silently dealing with the Holocaust pictures we've just been exposed to. <laughs> Hundreds of us are stuffed into a small waiting room with one bench offered for the crippled and obese. We are played an introductory movie, just like they do before you board a ride at Universal Studios. Large doors magically open with an airy fart, and we're herded into a large, dark theater, the temperature of a meat locker for an intense cinematic experience that turns our seats into massage chairs every time a bomb goes off. I'm fairly certain this film would cause horrendous flashbacks in veterans of any war. The man to my left jumps clear out of his chair and knocks his sunglasses to the ground when a kamikaze dive bombs us. I get motion sickness, practically lose my snails. Finally, fake snow falls from the ceiling and evaporates just above our heads as a soldier in the wilds of winter tundra writes a love letter to his gal back home. I turn then to find my mother in tears. Since the massage chair has knocked loose some old roller skating injury in the tailbone region, I cry with her. We sit miserable and snot streaked, our butts forced to jiggle as bombs rumble in the distance. <laughs> Suddenly our vision blurs as a veil of dry ice creeps in around us. We're deep in a jungle, alone and terrified. Nothing can be seen or heard. There's only the sense of impending doom and something else. Mom, digging around in her purse. Shh, I say, what are you doing? Her hand appears through the smoke, holding up a wad of crinkled Kleenex. All I got are used ones. She says, you probably don't want it. Just give it here, I say. I take it and dab my nose and eyes. Then I stuff the tissue into my purse where it shall remain long after completely falling apart. I meant to do this at the beginning, but I got carried away with my heroin joke. Um, <laughs> I wanted to thank uh, everyone at the UNCW Library for having me and to read. That's awesome, even though I keep calling it um, Thirsty Tomb. <laughs> um, and I want to thank everyone at the MFA program. It's been so amazing to be here the past few days and just see everybody. And I think there's something in the water that makes everyone look younger. Um, but maybe I'm wrong because Robert told me that I don't age. So I'm like, there's definitely something in the water in New Orleans, but it's not anything that makes you look younger. <laughs> something you probably don't want to drink. Um, anyway, thank you very much, and whoever's next, can I introduce, oh yes. <laughs> so, I'm actually just going to be up here pretty briefly. I'm going to be introducing uh, Robert Anthony Siegel, who's going to have a conversation with our author. And uh, he is an American writer who is, quote, fascinated by East Asia and the experience of cross-cultural encounter in all its beauty and confusion. He also writes about the complicated knot of family and place, the imaginative freedom that books and art provide, and the meaning of travel and food. Siegel's work has appeared in the New York Times, the, Lo the Los Angeles Times, the Oxford American, the Paris Review, and Tin House, among other publications and venues. He has written two novels, All the Money in the World, and All Will Be Revealed. I love the title. And the collection of essays, Criminals, is forthcoming from Counterpoint Press in 2017. Siegel has been a Fulbright Scholar at uh, Tonghai University in Taiwan, and I'm going to try and say this, Mambuka Gakusho Fellow at the University of Tokyo. His other, word, other awards include O. Henry and Pushkar Prizes, he is the associate professor. He is an associate professor at uh, in the Department of Creative Writing here at UNCW, and he also teaches frequently at the Iowa Summer Writing Festival. Please help me welcome Robert. Anthony. It makes me feel ten years younger because I saw you almost ten years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and here you've written this just wonderful book. 
And so we're going to talk a little bit uh, about the book and uh, the experience of writing the book. And, um, and then we're going to throw it to the audience and you guys can ask a few questions. We'll keep it short. Um, so my first question, last I saw you, you were here and you were a fiction student. And <laughs> you've written a memoir, nonfiction. What was that transition like? How did that happen? You lost your way somewhere. <laughs> I didn't lose my way. Um... Well, thank you, Robert. <laughs> Actually, Clyde just told me about an hour ago that my book is fiction. So, <laughs> um, I, I feel like um, I feel like I am um, half and half fiction, not fiction writer. I don't know. Like, I feel like uh, the books that I enjoy reading are all really character-driven and voice-driven books, like even in nonfiction, I would say that um, like really sort of almost fiction-esque uh, memoirs or like really good books like uh, This Boy's Life or Glass Castle or and Cold Blood, things like that have really obviously <coughs> shaped the way I write as well, just as much as uh, really classic fiction. Um, and because I think I studied um, and just wrote a lot of short fiction in that horrible thousand-page novel that I forced you to read. Um, <laughs> um, I obviously carried those techniques and that craft with me onto nonfiction. It's just that I'm inserting my family in the book as characters so that they can all hate me for the rest of my life. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They're actually okay with the book, but we can talk about that later, I guess. <laughs> so what then is as... A from the writer's perspective, what is the difference? What, how, how did it, you know, because I'm writing nonfiction now, and I'm sort of, um, um, sort of struggling with that experience. What's the difference? Well, I, for me, I feel like the difference is that you're reined in by like uh, reality, though, in a creative way. You know what I mean? So um, the stories are all true. Um, however, it's my representation of them, so obviously, I mean, that's the thing about nonfiction. Everybody's going to have, like, a different perspective on whatever. I think that I bring, like, a humorous perspective to my stories and, like, my family stories. Um, but, yeah, I mean, to me, that's the o really only difference. I don't know. I don't, I don't really write from a place in nonfiction that's, like... I, don't, I feel like I'm like half and half and half fiction nonfiction because I'm not like a um, like a Leslie Jameson or, or somebody like that who writes these essays and they're spending a lot of time researching these topics. I'm more like I'm just going to tell you about my life and like make fun of this. So in that respect, like the storytelling to me is more important. I don't know. So, okay. So here's my next Roger Lee question. Um, when you were here, you were primarily a, a short story writer. You, and Gwendolyn does these really lovely, um, funny, uh, extremely sharp short stories. But um, what was it like doing something with law? Well, it's funny you ask that. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, several of the pieces in this had already been uh, crafted as standalone pieces. And I really, I was just talking about this with uh, Clyde's class earlier. Um, I mean, to me, I viewed this book as essays, but that's not what the publishing house saw it as or really what they wanted. They saw it as a memoir. Um, so then it was going back in and trying to, to write thematically and shape them so that the, the narrative had uh, an arc and was a little bit more tied together. But um, yeah, I don't know. So I feel like almost a cheater or something because like these were short pieces that I was then, I had that base, I had that foundation and it made it a lot easier, I feel like probably to go in there and, and redraft it as a longer book, almost. But it was hard to like give up certain like certain um, essays got cut and stuff like that or shifted around, reshaped, which was kind of weird because it hurts to give up that stuff when you're a writer, you know. But yeah. I, don't know. I still I still feel like I'm far more comfortable writing short fiction and, and essays. 
but just because like the longer form seems so daunting, I feel like it feels daunting for any writer, you know? So, I don't know. Yeah, it can be intimidating. So in a way you sort of finesse that problem by doing a series of short pieces and then figuring out how to combine them. Looking back at my own experience, I feel often, you know, with a book, there's one big thing I've learned by the end. As a, as a writer, as somebody who has to make the next one, do you have a big thing that you've learned? I will never hire an outside publicist again. No, I, won't. Um, I won't, but uh, maybe I will. I don't. I did, I did, yeah, and I just, it was not, it wasn't good. Uh, <laughs> as for the writing, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know. I guess, yeah, I really, I don't know. I feel like pretty good about having this as a first book and, and uh, kind of as an introduction to my voice. And um, I feel like people don't take too kindly to when I talk about all the bodily fluids and stuff like that. So maybe that will be my takeaway lesson is to, you know, not too much TMI. Oh, that's totally who I am. Um, but yeah, I feel like um, the represent, like the humor and stuff. I tried not to be too jabbing or harsh, um, but sometimes humor can come off that way. So that's always something that's like a fine line, you know, because you don't want to like truly ruin somebody's life by making fun of them or something. You know what I mean? I feel when, when I read this, I was really impressed by the the honesty um, and. In writing, honesty relates to precision. There's tremendous um, visual and sensory precision in the writing, a physical precision that comes from a, a kind of emotional honesty that um, I found really affecting. Um, like all good, sad books, it becomes incredibly funny. Um, and it's a paradox, but I, I see that happening again. And your book really rides that feeling in a wonderful way. Uh, so you should be very proud. Yeah. Um, I, um, I'd like to open it up to you guys, any questions you have about um, the process of writing the book, um, life post-MFA, um, <laughs> New Orleans, um, uh, Gwendolyn works as a um, food journalist, she came and talked yesterday to my food writing class, it was a really um, fun and interesting discussion. So. Um, any questions you might have about making a life as a writer? It's a, it's a good opportunity. Ah, what over there? I do. You're just going to have to speak really loud. Stand up. <laughs> yeah. At what point did your family know you were writing? That's a great question. She asked, at what point did the family know? After I had that money in my bank account. <laughs> Um, actually, not before then. Uh, I, I told my sister that um, I had a book proposal out at publishing houses um, when that was happening, and then I told my mother after it actually, after I actually got a contract, because I was like, I'm not telling her unless this is actually happening. Um, but my mother's been like super easy to deal with, and she read the book, and I mean, she's accepting of it. Um, so my sister is actually the one who hasn't read it and she's been kind of weird about the whole thing. Um, but I mean, she's still like, uh, accepting and supportive in her own special way. <laughs> um, so Robert asked you if you learned anything about writing. I'm wondering, did you learn anything about your family through the experience of writing the book or was there a Maybe I should repeat that. Yeah. Um, Aurora asked, well, did you learn anything about your family through the experience of writing the book? I feel like um, it just, I feel like my mother and my sister and I are very close and we're a very strong unit and I, I feel like writing this book and then having my mother read it and she's accepting of it um, has definitely uh, made me believe that we are, even though it's, there's like a lot of craziness in there and a lot of crazy things happen. Um, I still feel like we are a functional uh, family and supportive of each other. So um, I feel like that sort of. Uh, 
Over here. I can actually hand you the <laughs> Um, the voice that you read your mother is the best thing ever. And A is is that a is that does it sound like your mother? And B, when you were writing, did did you hear her that way in that voice? Hmm. I'll repeat that. <laughs> um, that's really funny that you say that. My sister also uses that voice to do my mom. I don't know where it came from, but like when my sister and I get together and talk about my mom, we do that and we like do the expressions or whatever, but it doesn't sound like her. <laughs> uh, people are always really disappointed because it sounds, it's almost like this weird, like, um, I don't know, like Minnesota accent or something. And they're like, what? Uh, I mean, my mom. Um, but uh, I, I even do it to her face and she's like, you're scared. <laughs> And then wait, was it was there something? Um, Do you hear it in your head? Oh, when I write, no, I mm. actually hear like her real voice. Mm. That's just how it comes out, you know. Yeah. Like, I'm a bad comedian. <laughs> Are we at the end of these? We have one over here. Here's one. Where? It's uh. The, the humor you employ is so relentless throughout the story. I, I'm so used to <laughs> authors and comics kind of having this, this constant humor, but then there are these breaks of um, gravity and, and purity or sobriety almost. Um, so my question is, why have that relentless humor? And do you ever have those moments of clarity? Why have that relentless humor? And do you have moments of clarity? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like what you get on the page is pretty much what you get in real life. Um, uh, I, I, I just, I'm like an absurdist. That's how I, I am in real life. I'm always making fun of things. Um, very rarely do I get really serious. Um, I don't know. I, guess, I mean, I, I feel like in the writing it's different because you have to have that to balance out like the, the humor. Otherwise, it would just be way too much like vaudevillian or something. Mm -hmm. Which, when I was a uh, when I was first starting writing, it sounds like this. If she needs to start reading, because it's like um, sounds like the memoir. And then what else? I'm so bad at repeating. The oh, if there's a connection between. If there's a connection. The food writing and that memoir writing. Okay, if there's a connection writing. between the food writing for I do for Eater Nola and the memoir, and there really is not. Um, there isn't. I mean, the, the memoir is totally different, and when I think of the two forms of writing, I definitely think of the food writing as like a jobby job. You know, that's how I make money, that's how I survive, uh, by picking up freelance uh, food writing work and then also editing um, Eater New Orleans. And it is, I mean, like the Eater voice is irreverent and sort of snarky and funny, but it's, it's not like, you know, it's not anywhere near what my... Uh, voices for the memoir but um, as far as keeping them separate I mean I even do like the writing in different places different times you know it's like two separate activities and I look at the memoir and uh, as my that's my art form that's my creative writing that's my passion the food writing is really just so that I can survive and eat delicious foods <laughs> so. question? Back row, yeah, go ahead. How, how did you fall into food journalism? How did I fall into food journalism? Uh, when I moved to New Orleans, I worked at a cheese shop as a cheesemonger. Um, <laughs> and uh, a woman that I worked with was uh, writing reviews for a magazine called St. Charles Avenue Magazine, and she was moving and so she recommended me to her editor and they took me on. So I started doing that and it was part-time for a very long time. I, I worked as a, like a part-time food writer picking up freelance while doing other work for about um, four years. And then <clears throat> for the, since 2012, I've done it full-time, full-time freelancing food writing. <laughs> totally bizarre. Yeah. There was a question here. Uh, um, how far is it to rain? How hard is it? Oh, 
How hard is it to rein in my personality to do the food writing job? This is New Orleans we were talking about. Right? It's like, I am so mild compared to like half the food writers there who are just like the women in the, in the hats, the cat bed hats with the things, and they're like, darling, sugar, come here, we're gonna introduce you to Mr. Robinson. It's like crazy. I mean, it's crazy. Um, but I mean, I by trade or whatever, I mean, you just hone a voice, a more professional voice, mm. you know, and that is what, uh, whatever it calls for. If it's like a serious piece or, you know, a reverent piece, that's kind of what I try and tap into. I feel like I'm good with controlling voice, so, and writing. Lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Who are some of your like humor inspirations? Who are my humor inspirations? Hmm. Now I'm gonna have to think long and hard about this. I I don't know. I'm always reading and discovering new writers that I enjoy. I really um, like the novel The Sisters Brothers by Patrick DeWitt, which came out a few years ago, and it's a western, but it's like a humorous western. Um, I actually am really into westerns. Uh, so I thought he was like a really uh, good contemporary funny voice, Kevin Wilson also in Wells Tower. I like them. Uh, David Foster Wallace in like a weird way when he writes nonfiction is pretty funny to me. Mm. Sedaris, of course. Um, Sarah Vowell. Let's see, who else? Did you ever read No. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had somebody else recommend that. I don't know. I read. I read like uh, I read a lot. So, but those are like. Yeah, I've never. Read okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's do this. Um, yeah. But I don't. That's the other thing. Like I don't always read for humor. I'm not just like I have to be taking in all this humor. I just like to take in stories. You know, I like to take in very serious stuff too. So. Last chance. Who wants the last question? What's next? You stole my last question. <laughs> That's perfect. What's next? Well, I think we're going to go out to eat. And <laughs> I have one more night at my beach hotel. <laughs> then um, when I get back from this, I'm going to be working uh, pretty hard on a book proposal for a cheese book. Essentially, <laughs> sorry, I'm like burping into my phone somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Food writer. Uh, it's going to be sort of a meditation on cheese and friendship. Until, dear God, this stinks. Um, but yeah, until I have enough of a manuscript to be like, oh wait, that's not what it's about at all. Or an editor. Or an editor, yes. Um, but that's sort of the next thing. And also just working on, you know, like short fiction and stuff like that. Wonderful. We're, I, I'm looking forward. Thank you all so much. And um, there's uh, a table from Pomegranate's Books. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't need to say the <laughs> You're doing an amazing job. I just met Robert recently. He's so nice. <laughs> Closing remarks. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. I had help writing this. Thank you. <laughs> what a great event. This is so ingenuous now. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Sarah Watstein and Lisa Coates and all the members of Randall Library's PET. A special thank you to John Crawford, our digital and visual media coordinator, for designing the look of uh, Thirsty Tome. Uh, MFA graduate assistant Megan Ellis. Is Megan still here? She's right here. She designed the broadside that uh, we gave out to you all tonight, which is really cool. Um, and also uh, to Beth Staples, who's the assistant director of the publishing laboratory for organizing all of that. Thank you, Beth. Um, thank you again to Clyde and to Robert. And of course, thank you, thank you, thank you to Gwendolyn for coming all the way from New Orleans to be so funny. Um, Pomegranate Books is here. They're selling copies of Gwendolyn's hilarious memoir, After a While You Just Get Used to It, A Tale of Family Clutter. Please, please buy it. Um, Gwendolyn will sign it. She'll be here all night signing for you, as long as it takes. Um, thank you, guys. Have a great night. <laughs>